<clears throat> Thank you. OK, uh, welcome back to our class. Uh, some quick announcements before we start. Uh, how many of you managed to get homework one and terrible question to ask because if you didn't, you didn't realize your hand. Um, <clears throat> did someone not see the box? Was the box pretty obvious? We came there too early for D Day. OK, but we, I think we got yours. Okay. So you put it in the virtual box that we'd we someday do there. Door. Yeah, yeah, I got that. Okay. 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 So it'll just be out now that I have a box. It'll just be outside my, my office door uh, from time on. Uh, homework number two is due on Friday. Now this homework is a little bit different than the last one because we actually have some data sets that are being incorporated into it. So uh, make sure you take a look at it early. Make sure you tell me when things are not on there early. <laughs> um, but everything should be posted on there. Any questions about homeworks in general? We don't have them back yet. Yeah? Almost ready. Almost ready. OK. So, so a good reason to come to discussion is you'll get your homework back, yep. as if you needed one. All right. Uh, also a reminder, the office hours, Petty is having office hours after class. Actually, after mm -hmm. discussion on Wednesdays and on Mondays. Oh, Wednesdays. sorry. OK, yes. So not today. Never Monday mind. and Wednesdays. Monday and Wednesday. So after discussion <laughs> tomorrow, yeah. Petty will have office hours then. Uh, and I'll have office hours on Thursday morning, usual time. I was very lonely last week. Very sad. I actually got a lot done, so it's OK. But uh, if you have any questions, please come to office hours on Thursday morning. Um, burning questions. So I managed to look up one of the burning questions, which is about the plasma water. And indeed, there appears to be something called plasma water, which I had never heard about. Um, there is something called superfluid water. Superfluid is anything, anytime you have a, a gas or any kind of molecular composition at high enough pressures, uh, it becomes both a liquid and a gas at the same time. It shares properties of both of those. And so that's a very common phase for most molecules, this sort of superfluid phase. What they're talking about in this uh, study, so the, the object they were mentioning is, is sort of this guy, which is not really not this guy. This is just a circle drawn on a black, uh, black box <laughs> at about the size between Earth and Neptune. We know the size of this planet because it's one of these transiting planets that passes in front of its host star on a regular basis. And um, from that, you can infer what the radius of the object is. And it's somewhere between Earth and Neptune. And in our solar system, we don't have any objects that look like that. So we call these things super-Earths. And uh, a lot of speculation is why they have that size and what their composition is. We also know the mass of the object. And so from the mass and radius, we can estimate the density. And it turns out that that's hot enough or large enough uh, that it has to be made of something besides hydrogen and helium. At least if it's hydrogen and helium, it has to have a lot of other stuff inside of it. And so one of the theories is that this object has a lot of water in it. Turns out Neptune and Uranus also have a lot of water in them, uh, mostly in uh, sort of ice, ice phases. But this object is so massive uh, and it's compressed so much um, that that water can actually exist in this sort of unusual phase where it's not a gas, and it's not a fluid, but it's sort of a plasmonic superfluid. Uh, and it only happens at very high temperatures and very high pressures. You need the high pressures just to keep the water molecules together. Essentially, it forms kind of a weird metal lattice. Um, and the electrons are allowed to sort of leave the, the individual uh, water molecules themselves. And so it makes this kind of uh, you know, electrically conductive, uh, which is water actually is, but even more electric conductive material, uh, which is actually a molecule. So um, I actually looked up a little bit uh, some of the references. And so um, this is a sort of review, a physics review paper about water at very high temperatures and pressures. And just in the abstract, they mentioned that uh, that it forms a dense plasma. When you're inside something as, as dense as Jupiter's core or Saturn's core, this thing is much more massive than that. And so, actually, do you know 1214B? You know 1214B mass? No, I don't. Okay, so I'll actually look it up. I'm not sure if it's more massive or less massive, but it's certainly a very, very big object and very compact. And so it probably also has the same conditions, more than 20,000 Kelvin, 50 million bars of pressure. One bar of pressure is what you're feeling right now. Multiply that by 50 million. That's what the inside of Jupiter looks like. Uh, and a density which is actually comparable to iron, but it's a gas just compressed so much that it actually has densities very high. We're going to see densities even higher when we start talking about brown dwarfs and white dwarfs and neutron stars. <clears throat> In any case, um, there was another paper uh, actually by a colleague of mine up at Caltech who actually did a model for this, and that's exactly what they find, is that if this thing has a lot of water in it, that water has to have it be at such high pressures and such high temperatures uh, that it's in this sort of unusual state of matter where it's a molecular plasma. So 
I learned something <laughs> that I didn't know, that you can have molecular plasmas, and you can have sort of these strange materials in these very, very dense regions inside stars. We're going to talk, when we talk about inside stars of low-mass stars and brown dwarfs, uh, we know that the interiors of those are probably made out of some kind of metal metallized hydrogen or even possibly crystalline hydrogen, um, where the hydrogen gas is compressed so much that it starts to uh, form metal bands uh, as a sort of conductive medium. Um, but this is the first time I heard water being that, so, so it's been interesting. Been What's that? Has that been truly been done? Metallic hydrogen. Well, um, is that is really very controversial like because, you know, in the laboratory... Uh, you can make metallic ammonia and ice as well be. Well, yeah, even the ammonia stuff is very controversial. So uh, uh, we do laboratory experiments where you sort of take these anvil presses and you smash them together very, very... Yeah. And that can get up to pressures... I think they might be able to get up to like a megabar or a few megabars now. Um, the insides of brown dwarf, 12 megabars. Just so 12 megabars. Um, you know more about this, so you should talk. Kind of things. <laughs> okay. I just know that metallic hydrogen is extremely controversial. As we face that. Also, um, something yeah. else you had said before, where you had mentioned, assuming that it is water, it would have to be in this state. So, do they know that it is water and that it is in this state, or is it? Yeah. Given this density, we look at it might be being water, and if it was water. So it's more like that. And in fact, even that is not completely robust because all you know is the average density. Right? You know the vast radius. And the game in these sort of models is to put together the right mix of materials that will give you that mass and that radius and that average density. Um, water is a very hot topic for planets. You know, finding a water planet is better than finding a gas giant planet. Uh, and so there's a lot of push to describe this thing as a water planet as one of the options. But there are other options where you can have a very massive iron core, and just a regular hydrogen atmosphere, and that would also make the same thing. So it's the title you can publish. <laughs> Bingo. So, um, yeah, so it's important, you know, even in, uh, even in this paper, they talk about alternative models. They favor this model because it works, and it's, you know, in terms of, I mean, we know that Uranus and Neptune are very heavily, uh, heavy in ices, because that's, in the region where they form, there's a lot more ice in their early solar system uh, than, than metals. Um, but it's still, it's very controversial. So, yeah, good question. 6.36 yeah. Earth. Thank you. So much less massive than Jupiter, uh, but still much more, much more dense and more massive than, than the Earth. Okay, yeah. How hot is 20K? 20,000 Kelvin. Yeah. Hot. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a bomb, though, hydrogen. Uh, well, so uh, when we talk about uh, fusion, you need to get about get to about 3 million Kelvin okay. to ignite fusion. So this is well below the fusion temperature. Right. Um, but it's certainly above the point where you would normally ionize most materials. So if you think of the surface of the sun, uh, in fact, we may even get to that calculation today. The surface of the sun is something like 5,800 Kelvin. So about four times less than that, three or four times less than that. And most of the material on the surface of the sun is ionized. So you don't have to get very hot to ionize things. Now, at high pressures, it's actually harder to ionize. But but when you get up to 20,000 Kelvin, it's, it's hard to keep those electrons down. Other questions? So who, I don't know, who raised this? Thank you for raising it. I learned something. Appreciate it. Has anybody produced uh, water in that form on Earth in a lab? I don't think so. This paper is a, is a quantum calculation. Paper. So they just they just run a quantum uh, calculator. It's a, theory. To, it's a theory. Yeah. Um, yeah. As far as I know, actually you would know. They're not doing water experiments at these. No, they're not. Right. Yeah. Like Why are they doing ammonia experiments at these pressures and temperatures? Um, I think because they're expecting the moons of Jupiter to be have a lot okay. of ammonia oceans and have ammonia ices there. That was my understanding of the thing. Okay. Tore through at that point. Okay. And we're pretty good. Yeah. Okay. I mean, actually, I should say the first paper I found on this was something written in the 1960s and it was on a military site. So uh, it didn't have any nice figures on it, so I didn't include it. But um, maybe there's another reason why you want, want to know about water at high pressures and temperatures. Okay. Um, and the last announcement uh, oh, is there any other burning questions anyone has? Yeah. You can I ask a question about cumbersome too, a specific problem. Mm, if it's quick. Um, you ask us to code in 5C. Is it all right yeah. if we just use an iterative method and the false point method? And That's coding. On paper. But. Uh, okay. You could do it on paper, sure. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's going to be a lot easier to, to do it in a... It's two iterations. Sense. Okay. Yeah. Well, all, right. all right. You want to do it that way. Right. Uh, you will have to program later, though. Okay. So. <laughs> okay. That's weird. All right. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Uh, last thing is um, there are two seminars, uh, two astro astro related seminars this week. One in the astrophysics uh, seminar, one in the physics uh, colloquium. I'll talk about the physics colloquium one on Thursday because that's when it is. Tomorrow we're doing the astrophysics colloquium, and it's actually not a usual astrophysics topic. It's actually an astrophysics demographics topic. Um, Professor Meg Urey, uh, who is the uh, who is the chair of uh, the Yale Department of Physics, is now the president of the American Astronomical Society. Uh, is going to be talking about uh, demographics in particular where are all the women in physics and astronomy. Um, this is a plot of the percent of women who've earned bachelor degrees uh, over sort of this 20, uh, 20 30 year period. Um, and uh, you know, just to remind yourselves that uh, half the population is women. Yep, right? <laughs> Am I right that? Okay. Uh, but this only goes up to about 20%. And in fact, it's been flat for the last few years, last decade or so. Um, so I should, this is a, a topic that's very uh, dear and dear to my heart. I have a lot of uh, women uh, students who uh, work in my lab. I've had a women advisor. Um, and uh, it's a very interesting problem in terms of understanding what about our culture in physics uh, causes. Is that the yeah. percent of women get degree in uh, physics or in general? Physics, bachelor degrees. So if you look at biology, this is about 60%. You look at um, literature. It's so about the population in California. Fifteen million of women. Sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, all right. Plus, plus minus one. Yeah, they're and, probably uh, not all physicists. And uh, you said that uh, out of fifteen million, twenty something percent get a degree. No, no, physics. no. Out of all physics bachelor's degrees earned, twenty percent of those earned were earned by women in this in this oh, period. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. If everyone in California got a physics degree, <laughs> I would be rich. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I wouldn't be rich, but at least I'd have a big class, uh, and we probably wouldn't have like you know climate change deniers stuff like that. But um, yeah, no, this is just people who are exactly, exactly. Um, so this, you know, it's an interesting topic. It's an interesting topic in looking at the culture of. You know this field of physics that many of you are planning on going in or are currently in already, um, and so uh, you know I invite you to go to this talk because uh, there's just it's an interesting study on on the way we interact. Yes, sir. Where is she from? She's she was the chair of the department of physics at Yale. She's still at Yale, uh, uh, okay. and now she's uh, the president of American Astronomical Society. That's why she's not the chair anymore because you can't. It's very hard to do both. So is this a talk that she's like going on tour with? Yeah, so I should mention that. So there, if did anybody here read the New York Times? One lonely person. Okay, so uh, there was an article in New York Times this weekend in their magazine about this topic. It was like a seven-page article on this, and, and, and she was featured very prominently because she's been working on this for 30 years. So. Everybody yeah. math and uh, mechanical engineering. Oh yeah, I tell you about it. So engineering is about uh, about 13 percent. Okay. Math is about 25. It's a little bit better, but not much. Chemistry is about 35, 40. Mechanical engineering. It's about seven or eight, seven. somewhere around there. Yeah. Yeah. Engineering is the only only other topic that's yeah, very. Uh, electrical engineering. I don't know. Like I don't know. Yeah. It's probably somewhere in the same range. Yeah. yeah. Um, what about PhDs? PhDs is lower. So I. I don't have the numbers on me right now, but I think we're it's somewhere around 15, 14, 15 percent. Uh, faculty, it's about 10 percent. UCSD faculty, it's 8 percent. So, yeah. But she doesn't pay well. Uh, it, well, it, you know, it pays better than a lot of other jobs, especially right now when the government shut down, right? Um, yeah, so uh, so I invite you to come to the talk. It's a very interesting, you know, again, if you're going into physics as a career, it's kind of good to know what the field is like, not just in terms of like research and stuff like that, but actually like in terms of you know people, because we work with people. This is different than Europe. Or um, Europe is a little bit better, but not much. A little bit better, but not much. Latin America is a lot worse. Latin America is about five percent. So, yeah. Okay.
All right, let's do a quick review of what we talked about last uh, Thursday. Uh, typical magnitude of proper motion for stars near the sun. Calculate this in class. What are the, don't look at your notes, what are the units of proper motion? Arc second sphere. Arc second sphere, OK. So what would be a magnitude of a top proper motion of a star? Point one, one. It's about half. So you're about you're exactly right, right? Because order magnitude, that's fine. So yeah, something around 0 0.4, 0 0.5 arc seconds per year. And importantly, that's a very you know what's what's the resolution of our eye? One arc. One arc minute, right? So one, 60 arc seconds, right? Think you know think about the, you know the moon is about half a degree. We can easily resolve that. But anything smaller than that, we start to get kind of fuzzy on. So if you can if you can put you know 30 eye pixels across the moon, that's about normal vision. Right? Some of us have worse vision than others, uh, but that's much small, too small to see by eye, and which explains why it took until about the 18th century uh, for the first proper motion to be recorded, and that took looking at data going 1,850 years back. All right, so it's per year, right? So we multiply by 1,850, that becomes a pretty sizable motion. Um, but on a year-to-year -year basis, these motions are very tiny. Of course, today we can measure these very easily, right, with a, with high-resolution high resolution astrometry and, and large telescopes. Um, but it took a long time to be able to do this. Uh, in fact, we couldn't do this without a telescope. It required a telescope to see that the heavens moved. Yeah? When they go back 1,850 years, how well or how accurate are those measurements? Yeah, excellent question, yeah, because, you know, Parkos probably didn't even use. Well, actually, I don't know if that's if he may have. They may have had a similar degree arc cycle because the 60, 60, um, you know, division by sixty was Babylonian, so that might have carried through. But uh, an excellent question, an absolutely excellent question. Um, and I, I haven't read the paper, which was written in seventeen eighty one. But uh, this is actually not uncommonly done today. There are more recent catalogs, for example, the, we'll talk about probably on Thursday the stellar um, catalog of the Henry Draper catalog, uh, which was made in the sort of turn of the 20th century. Uh, and uh, people still use that catalog to look for variations in spectroscopy spectra and, and changes over very long periods of time, so 100 year time scales. Um, so I suspect, you know, Hipparchos wrote a catalog of the very brightest stars, and whoever did this looked at where those stars are now and noticed one was not where it was supposed to be. But I'm guessing. I don't know. I didn't read the paper. Okay. Total power emitted in radiation is called what? Astronomical jargon. Bolometric what? Uh, luminosity. Luminosity. Yeah. Excellent. Luminosity. Yeah. Luminosity. Anything that is total power is luminosity. So when we talk about luminosity, that's everything coming off the star in radiation. We're not going to talk about winds too much. How about the power emitted per unit area? <laughs> Just wait and see if that changes again as I start. <laughs> okay, what is it? Flux. 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 Flux, yeah. Which of these two do we normally measure? Flux. Absolutely flux. Because we can't actually put a detector around the sun yet. <laughs> Not yet. Okay. So no, we usually measure is a small area and we measure the flux and then we extrapolate off to, to, uh, to all the directions. Uh, what of these sort of jargons does a spectrum measure? You may have said it, I'm just looking around. <laughs> it sticks. Well, is it luminosity? Is it flux? Yes. All right, you're taking a wavelength. Okay, so what is flux per wavelength? Nope, the other one. All right, this is just jargon, but it's flux density. All right, flux density is energy per second per area for either wavelength or frequency, either one of those. Depends on what kind of spectrum you're measuring. Uh, but that is breaking down that brightness as a function of where in the spectrum it lies. All right, we're going to see a lot more of this in the next couple days here. All right, true or false, our senses are logarithmic. 
Oh, no, false. 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 Yeah, it's false. OK, we've had a lot of time. That's just a, that's just a trivia question. Uh, and more distant stars tend to have smaller or larger magnitudes. Absolute or larger. Trick question. I mean, here's the one. Your absolute or apparent magnitude? It could just be brighter and be farther. Okay. I'm just messing with you. You had it the reverse go. It's <laughs> not true. All right, yeah. So given the same brightness, they appear, apparent is actually an important uh, key word here, which I left out. Their apparent magnitudes have to be larger. All right, larger means fainter. Larger magnitudes are fainter. More positive is more faint. Uh, more negative is more bright. Uh, and the scale is about five magnitudes for every factor of ten in distance. We go back. Okay, which means you know ten. So it's factor ten. So ten parsecs is pretty immediate neighborhood. What's the scale size of the galaxy? How far to the center of the galaxy within a factor of ten? Uh, it's funny how these answers just kind of bubble along. Uh, 8.5 kiloparsecs is, is pretty much as close to right as we know. So let's say 10 kiloparsecs just to be order of magnitude about it. All right, so stars that are 10 parsecs away, all right, 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, four times 20 magnitudes difference in brightness. So you can see that this drops off really fast. So anything that's a really bright star, all right, 10 parsecs, remember that's our scale for absolute magnitude. Uh, will be incredibly faint out at the this at even the galaxy even in our own galaxy be very very faint. Okay, any questions on those topics? Yes, sir. So what is intensity? So a good question. Intensity. So we so luminosity is power. Flux is power per area. Flux density is power per area per wavelength. And what's the last thing we can divide by? Solid angle. Per solid angle, or kind of per direction, almost, right? So, like, you know, if you know, we've talked about sort of the, uh, you know, as you break this thing down, the simplest example is there's just one point of light that's emitting in all directions. In which case, luminosity, the flux, the flux density is all going to be easily measured. But of course, we know that things may emit in different directions in different amounts. So that you have to take account flux for that. Uh, they may emit different amounts in different wavelengths, and they may emit different amounts depending on what angle you're receiving the light. Right? So that's where the straighting comes in. So that takes into account effects of your detector being slightly off, or uh, if even the source that you're looking at might have a certain profile and then turns away from you, that will change the intensity that you observe. So, so that part we measure intensity because we're sort of angle from the star. All we know is that solid angle or um, direction. Technically, yes. Technically, that's true. Um, for the most part, uh, even if you're looking at a star towards the horizon, we're really getting all the light that's coming directly from that star. We're not really looking at it askance. We might be looking at it askance through our atmosphere, but the star is so far away that it's essentially directly away from our line of sight, no matter what. Even the sun is like that. So you really have to get something nearby where the light that it's emitting is being seen at an askance angle. Does that make sense? Yeah, so because we're so far away, it's just... Yeah, everything is essentially coming straight time. down. Yeah. Or coming straight in at us, yeah. Does relativity play any role in uh, measuring these values? Uh, sure. I mean, it, you know, it, if, uh, if you have a gravitational lens, all right, that could magnify the light that was behind the lens. And so you have to take that into account in how the light propagates in your direction. Sure. In that case, you do want to take into account intensity more than these other values because the actual beam, yeah, I'm you know, the beam that's closer to the lens will be deflected more than the beam that's further from the lens, and that will change how bright it is. So, so maybe maybe another way to think about intensity is intensity is following the rays of light individually, at some level, and how those interact with your detector is a measure of intensity. And then when you take all those beams that hit in your your detector, that's a flux density. Okay. Okay. It's a little confusing, but we'll talk about intensity a little bit more today. All right. OK. So um, can you turn the light, one of the lights back on so we don't totally fall asleep? Oh, wait. Actually, don't. Sorry. <laughs> so we're talking about, uh, I'm just going to review really quickly our discussion of magnitudes and move on to black body radiation. 
excuse me, record region. I wanted to show this picture. This is a picture uh, from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which is a survey uh, that imaged uh, basically the northern sky uh, to incredible depth uh, with multiple filters. And what you're looking at is a color picture that was compiled by basically taking the light from all those filters and stacking it together. And so some stars have spectra that emit more light at shorter wavelengths. Some stars that have light emit more light at longer wavelengths. Um, and as a result, you'll see that there are different colors of stars here. Now, if you have really good vision in your dark space, you can actually see this. Has anyone actually seen stars of different colors with their naked eye? Okay. Did you? Where did you go to do that? In the Brega. In the Brega. Yeah. Out, you had to go out, right? <laughs> it's really hard to see for our eyes to see color with all the other ambient light uh, here in San Diego. Um, but of course, when you have a ni nice big telescope, it's very easy to separate their their colors very well. Uh, and so this is a, again, this is the color image, and you can see. So one thing I'll just point out, and we're going to talk a little bit more of this later. Uh, what what color are most of these stars? Right. True, especially the little tiny ones. But are the ones that you can see a color of? Yellow. 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 So kind of orangey, reddish, yellowish, sort of on that end of the spectrum, right? Um, so what we'll, we're going to talk about later on is, in fact, most of the stars, so most stars that we see are usually something like kind of yellowish, mix of blue, mix of a little bit of red. When we actually count the stars near the near the sun, almost all of them are red stars. 70% 70, 70 of those stars are actually red, what we call red dwarfs. Um, because of very low temperature, right? Um, but when you look at just the sky, the bright ones, the hot ones, are actually quite bright, and so they can dominate the, 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 the how you see them. Um, and you end up sort of with a good mix, but in fact, 70% of the stars near us are actually these red things. Okay. Um, all right, I'll need a light for that. Okay, so we were talking about magnitudes, and I just want to real quickly remind everyone that the definition of this, uh, if you have a magnitude of your star, and you compare it to some reference star, which we usually compare to Vega as our reference star, just by convention, then we define the magnitude, magnitude in terms of the ratios of the fluxes usually. But you can also compare them to the luminosities. You can compare them to intensities. Right? At some level, uh, particularly if you're comparing stars that are at the same distance, distance scales factor out of here. And so flux and luminosity turns out to be about the same. Uh, but fluxes are usually what we compare them to. Uh, and we can do this in not just sort of over across the entire spectrum, which is a what kind of magnitude? Volumetric. Exactly. Volumetric magnitude. That's all of the light at all wavelengths can actually. Uh, most of the time, you see these magnitudes in terms of in terms of individual filters. Uh, and in particular, when we go up uh, to use the uh, uh, we go up to use the uh, Lick telescope at the end of the quarter, uh, we'll be using a filter set that includes ultraviolet, blue, visible, red, and infrared. Uh, these are sort of the classic visible light filters. And you're going to see in your reading a lot of references, particularly to blue, blue and B, B and B. Those are just individual filters that are fine, made you know, decades ago, and everyone has roughly close to the same type of filter on the telescope. And so when they say, I measure B magnitude of 10.6, hopefully that's the same magnitude that someone else measures on the telescope. Or the thing might actually be very, most of the time, the instruments are better. Um, and then we talk about the difference between apparent magnitude. So this is apparent, and it's literally what the star looks like. from our perspective, right, here on Earth. Um, but it doesn't necessarily tell us anything about the star itself, because as, you, as the two of you mentioned on this figure, some of those, uh, some of those stars uh, may be bright and far away, so they look fainter. Some of the stars are nearby, but they're hopefully not as faint, but they may appear, appear to be the same brightness. So it doesn't tell us necessarily about their actual property of the star itself. It tells us about how we see them. And the way we get around this is we define an absolute magnitude uh, where the difference is minus 5 log 10 of the distance over 10 parsecs. 
And I have to say, I always have to check that I got my sign right in this. Signs in magnitude are always a vein. So I just write something down and I say, okay, well, if it's 100 parsecs, that's 2, that's, uh, sorry, that's 1, that's minus 5, and that would tell me that the absolute magnitude is less than or brighter than the apparent magnitude. Whoa. <laughs> okay, and that's right. Okay, so that's why you sign right. So, you know, it's easy to get this wrong. Uh, just do that argument every time. That's what I do. Struggle so what? What do you have to think about there? Uh, in here? Yeah. D, which is distance, distance. over 10 parsecs. Okay. So by defining every star to be at 10 parsecs for absolute magnitude, you sort of said you, you normalize all this stuff out with distance variables out. And now when we talk about the absolute magnitude of the star, it's an actual property of the star itself. In fact, it maps directly to the oscillators. Okay. Um, all right, so I'm going to move on from there and talk about a little bit more detail about what the spectrum of the star actually looks like. So this is a very coarse way of measuring the star. Right? If you measure the UVBRI magnitudes, this is the flux coming at us from that star over these sort of big wavelength ranges. Right? And you can kind of piece together those measurements, which is called photometry, and say something about the distribution of light as a function of wavelength, but it's just five little numbers. So it doesn't tell us a lot of detail about the star. What we'd like to know is a little bit more about how the brightness varies as a function of radiation, as a function of wavelength in more detail, because then we can start seeing features like different lines, uh, radial velocity, stuff like that. But first, we want to talk about the shape of the star. Uh, and that shape, as you probably know, is called the black body spectrum. Okay, so um, I'm going to state this first, and then I'll ask if you want me to uh, derive it in some detail. Um, but when you take into consideration, so black body is, is simply that. If you have some a cavity that is in complete thermal dynamic equilibrium, right? So there's no like bright feature, you know, there's no hot area over here, cold area over here, there's nothing that's reflective and bouncing that around. Everything is sort of equilibrated at the same temperature. That's a black body, right? Um, you know, this is the black body. I think the inside of this black, all photons coming out of this box, particularly if I cover this up with that such a little hole, it will appear black. <laughs> if I cover this up except for a little tiny hole, what will the inside of this look like? Black. black. <laughs> it's black body. Now, is it really black? Is there no light in there? No, it's just not coming out. Uh, well, radio is maybe, there's probably a little radio, but that's a little bit too too low in, in wavelength, or too long in wavelength. I'll try this one. Infrared. Infrared, yeah. So to our eyes, it's black, because we don't have the capability with our eyes to actually see infrared light. But in fact, if you had infrared eyes, the inside of this box would be positively glowing. You'd be glowing at the temperature of this box, which is about 300 Kelvin, and the same temperature and same amount of photons. Right. So black body is a little bit of a misnomer. It's only because we have the eyes that don't see the, the thermal radiation from the things around us, uh, except for the stars. Okay, so um, so the, the equation for this, I'll just state this first, and then we'll talk a little bit about it in detail. Um, there are two different forms of the black body function. There's one that depends on wavelength. Clear, clear there. All right. So that's a function of wavelength, and then we can also write a similar function as a as a function of frequency. I'm going to use what well, this looks like a v, but it's actually a Greek nu. They are indistinguishable in my handwriting. Um, and that's just equal to. Okay, now, um, both of these are equivalent in the sense that when you integrate up 
the black body radiation as a function of wavelength over all wavelengths. All right. So remember, this is so this is actually an intensity, but if we, if we you know integrate out the angle part, which we'll do in a second, and we integrate over all wavelengths, what we're measuring is the total amount of energy coming off an object. And that shouldn't depend on whether we're measuring it as a function of wavelength or as a function of frequency. It's just the energy coming off the object, right? Total amount. And so this is equal to doing the same interval, but as a function of frequency. And if these two intervals, which is the total energy, or total flux really in this case, coming off an object, are the same, that means that the things inside the intervals are the same, which means that B lambda of t is equal to B nu of t times D nu B lambda. And that's what connects these two equations up. The second equation is what? B of? B of nu, which I'm using as frequency. Frequency. Oh. Yeah. And t. Uh, actually, I don't know. What, what does the book use for frequency? Nu is a pretty standard. OK. 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 So um, who has <laughs> never seen this before? That's good. Question? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. You said I, the I need you raise your hand for that, but you had to You said the integral is equal to flux or energy. So, uh, so this is say, this is intensity. Okay. So when we do the integral over wavelength or the integral over frequency, what we're going to end up with is something that's like ergs, sorry, that's wrong units, uh, watts per meter squared per steradian. So it's actually not a unit we've talked about, but you can easily calculate it. And it, you know, it turns out if you're looking at the same object, it shouldn't depend. You know, you're making the same measurement, so that per steradian part doesn't really actually matter in this case, right? Whatever we integrate over the rays that are coming to us, they're the same rays here as they are here. And so in effect, this is more of a watts per meter squared, which is a flux. And in that case, again, because all it, all this is measuring is just the total amount of light coming off this object. It shouldn't matter whether we measure it as a function of wavelength or as a function of frequency. It's the same energy. And so that's why these two things have to be the same. Okay. I just want to sort of make sure we draw a connection between these two things. OK. Um, all right, so everyone's seen this before. Who has seen a derivation of it? Who has not seen a derivation of it? A lot more of you. OK. Who would like to see a derivation of this in a fairly compact brief How many lines? What's that? How many lines? It's a couple. Why wouldn't you? Um, no, I, I could. I, it's just me writing stuff. So. OK, well, I'll do it because it's good for you. Um, actually, before I go on that, let me, no, I'll do that first. I'll do that first. OK, so you know, I should say that the history of this function, it's really empirical uh, to start off with. I mean, th this sort of distribution, you know, no one wrote this down from, a, from, from an experiment. But what they could see were the extremes of this equation at very short and very long wavelengths. Uh, at very short wavelengths, uh, right, so very short wave, sorry, very short, yes, very short wavelengths, OK? T, uh, wavelength is small. So this number is small. So e to the 1 over that number is big, which means that this number is big, so it's much, much bigger than 1. So you can cancel that out, and you get something that depends on the exponential. And that's called the Weems law. All right. And again, that's seen when you look at something, say, at UV radiation, UV wavelengths. Or if you look at something that's at a te thermal temperature, but you're looking at the optical, you're really into the Weems uh, Weem law, short wavelength law. Uh, now, if you and to do the other case where you do it very long wavelengths, so say you make radio measurements of something that's emitting thermal radiation, well, in this case, this number, this exponential is much smaller than 1. And so you get something that just depends as 1 over lambda to the fifth. And so there were many years of measurements at sort of these extremes. And part of the reason they said extremes is because mostly what they were measuring was thermal radiation from sort of things here on Earth. And it's a lot easier to make radio measurements and visible light measurements than infrared measurements. Right? Infrared detectors were really came around in sort of 1960s. Like we're talking back in sort of the 1800s where these first measurements were made. Right? 
So they had an idea of sort of the, you know, the tail and the trunk of the, em uh, the elephant. But they had no idea what the elephant looked like. Now, uh, it turned out that you can derive at least uh, this version of it from quantum principles. And what we do is we assume that we have a black body box, okay, so that all of our radiation is contained in, in some box that's kept at a constant temperature. Could be that box, for example, if we use it. Uh, and we'll say that this is a perfect cube for now, uh, but we'll be able to get rid of that assumption later on. I'll decide that. Now, if this, if all the radiation is contained inside this box, that actually sets a constraint on what kind of radiation you can have in the box. Uh, because if the radiation doesn't get outside one way or the other, uh, that means that the wavelengths of light, you essentially have sort of a resonant cap. So the wavelengths of light have to fit nicely inside the box. If they don't fit nicely inside the box, they'll be sort of dissipated and the box and not so only the wavelengths of light that fit nicely inside this box. Go back and forth, aren't they? Exactly, they'll stay, they'll stay put. Okay. But at least they won't be damped out by whatever sort of resistance is on the edges. Okay, so that sets a constraint on what wavelengths of light you can have inside this box. And that's very simply uh, one half of the length of the box times some number, right? And that number is actually for the three sides of the box. Because you can have wavelengths up this way, you can have wavelengths up and down, you can have wavelengths go back and forth. For the time being, we're not including things going diagonally yeah. uh, here, but you can do that as a summation of multiple of those three directions. Okay. So these are the kind of wavelengths we can have that fit nicely in the box. This is starting to sound very quantum mechanically, uh, which means that you can write down either the electric or magnetic fields for these things pretty simply. Hopefully this is something you've done sort of, is it, has everyone taken like 130 yet? 130 to quantum class? Or 2D, D? Oh, I don't know. All right, so you could write down, in these kind of nicely constrained uh, geometries, you can just write down what the electric and magnetic fields are. Because again, the electric field has to disappear at the edge of the box because you can't have a photon that's sort of halfway through the box. So that's just a series of sign functions. Okay. This function of x is a function of y, a function of z, and three independent quantum numbers. Fraction of the any questions on why I can just write this down? What's the m1, m2, m3? So those are the uh, essentially the, the, the multiples of uh, sort of ups and downs you can have inside. So let's say, for example, like this is just 1. Right? Then it's sine pi x over l. So at 0, this is 0. At l, this is 0. Is that right? High is zero. Yeah. Okay. High is zero. Um, so that's something that looks like this. Assuming integers. What's that? Assuming integers. Yes. Sorry. Yes. These are all integers. Thank you very much. Okay. If this was two, then that would make a full cycle of two pi. If this was four, it would make harmonics. These are all harmonics. These are all harmonics that fit inside the box. Okay. okay. So that's why I can just write that down because I know. They have to be sine functions, so they have to go to zero at the other end. They're just multiple. How do you know which harmonics? So the harmonics are just based on how many half pumps can fit in there, and that's an integer number. You only have an integer number of half pumps. Very technical explanation. Okay, moving on. All right. Um, and then you can write down the wave equation for this, right? That's just one over d squared, d squared d, d squared. There's a minus sign in there. All right, that's just our normal wave equation for electromagnetic radiation, where the speed of light is used for the ratio. All right? And because these are all sine terms, uh, I forgot. Oh, sorry. Yeah, there's one more term here because we need to have our our time term as well. And if you write out all of, if you do this gradient, right, that's just taking two derivatives of this, two derivatives of this, 
two derivatives of this, in which case you always get back a sign and a sign, a sign. So you always get back e in this case, but you drop out two terms of what's inside the sign term. That just gives you a dispersion relation between all of these quantum terms. Uh, oh, no, because no, I have the time over Yeah, if I use it, at least so he mentions it down on there, square gradient thing, right? That includes the derivative of time. At least through with like C T or put a constant yeah, somewhere in there. That would just equal zero. But I'm just moving that back over here. Yeah, so that's not scary. I don't think there's a negative one though. Yeah, I don't think um no, you're right. right. Thank you, yes. That's so then, so that's the left side, and this is the right side. Uh, two, uh, yeah, two pi. Uh, I got this right. All right, two pi c squared. I'm going with c squared. Okay, so that, and then this is uh, this is our lambda squared up here. Uh, so I cancel all my pi values. All right. This gives me an L over 2, which is my lambda with n equals 1. And that's where we get a sort of all the different way of Okay? Okay. All right. So, um, so okay, so let me just cancel all the L's so we get those out of the way. So if you write this down, this is just, this is like a radius, right? This is n1, which corresponds to x, n2, which corresponds to y, n3 corresponds to z. This is x squared plus y squared plus z squared. So radius squared is equal to uh, is equal to one in this case, or is equal to lambda squared. And so if I want to know what modes are allowed up to some given wavelength, it's essentially what combination of n one squared, n two squared, n three squared gets me to that lambda. Right? It's a, it's a geometry equation. For reason. So one of the questions we can ask is, again, we're, what we're trying to so let me take a step back. What we're trying to figure out is how much light there is as a function of wavelength. And how much light there is depends on how many different modes of radiation you're allowed to have. How many of these uh, quantum numbers are you able to occupy for a given wavelength? Okay. So again, since that's just an area, or sorry, a, a radius, we can draw a kind of funny Cartesian diagram, which is just our quantum numbers. And that equation basically says that in this sort of positive quadrant here, right, this is all where they're greater than 1, out to some radius, which is n1 squared plus n2 squared plus n3 squared. Square root. Uh, thank you, square root. Yeah, one half over it. You might just leave it correct as that. Uh, out to that radius, that's all the modes that could be contained up to this wavelength of lambda, and lambda over L, but after that sort of nice big length. So again, if the question is, how many possible modes? Well, it's just the volume of this space of quantum numbers. That volume contains all the possible nodes, or modes of radiation inside this little box. How do I write that volume down? In this sort of n space, n space kind of way. Is that integer that is great quantum enough? Right, so if this was a really cold gas, you have to be careful. But I'm assuming we're looking at that box. And that box has a lot of modes. Right, so they're quantum numbers, but they're a ton of quantum numbers, so we can treat this fairly. We will have cases later on where we do have to worry about actual spots. But this is a fairly continuous sort of So what's the volume of this quarter of a or eighth of a sphere? Uh, yeah, so one eighth of uh, four pi over three times n one squared plus n two squared plus n three squared. Yeah. That's the number of modes. Z, 
Yeah. Or Spare root to the power power. Yeah. Yeah. There's three apps, thank you. Yes. Okay, so there's a number of modes uh, for this box. Okay. And those modes are again related to the wavelength of radiation that's contained in here. Right? Through our dispersion relationship. And so this is equal to divide out by the, the two here. This is equal to two pi over six. Or to go to two pi, sorry, two pi, pi over six. six. Yeah. There is actually two later on, we'll come in a second. Uh, and then times land over sorry about this. I made a slight error over here because uh, This should be two pi over lambda. Yeah, because this this stuff is like okay. So this is actually equal to uh, lambda two pi over lambda squared. Sorry about that. All right, just dimensionally that has to work out. We have one on the length here, but this has to be one over lambda here. And in terms of time, we're looking at a thing that makes one cycle over two pi. The way right? uh, and so when we factor that all in, that's just right, that's all these terms, n1 squared over sin 2 squared over 3 squared, uh, times L squared over here. This is going to give us L to the 3 halves, so this is L over this is L2. Over lambda cube. And then we have 2 cubed would be 8. And let me make sure I got this all right. Okay. Right? Now, this is the number, so this is the number of, again, this is the number of, this is essentially the number of modes that allow for a given wavelength. Lambda. And that's for a photon being on every quantum number. But in fact, these are spin one particles. So how many lambdas do we have in each of these quantum nodes? One half to the spin minus one. So uh, sorry, it's not sorry, it's not two, it's just spin one particles. So photons just photons can come to us, you know, in, in sort of the electromagnetic waves going back and forth, right? They can be polarized in different directions. So sometimes they're left-handed polarized, right-handed polarized. Sometimes they're polarized this way. Sometimes they're polarized this way. Right? Every case you have two polarizations. So there's two quantum states you can really have with the polarization. So there's a times a number two here for polarization. Okay. Uh, and so we factor all this stuff out. We should have, I uh, drop something, we should have 8 pi over 3 over lambda cubed over, over L cubed over lambda cubed. So I drop some vector of 2 here. This is 4. This is 2 squared. I think this is actually. That works if I do that. So let me chase down the numbers on, the, on my notes here. But that should, that should give us 8 pi over 3 times L cubed over lambda cubed. Take my word for it. Okay. So let me, yeah. Um, I want you to have a question. Over yeah. here, on the That's last 16. line right there. What's that? On the last line right. Yeah. Um, you have 2c squared over c squared. Yeah. So that's saying. And one square plus two square plus two raised squared is equal to four. Yeah. Um, so I think I think I got this wrong here. This is probably going to be two pi c t over the wavelength. This would give us the wavelength here, and that would give me. If I cancel out my pi, that should be two over wavelength squared. Now it's two pi c over t. Because in one wavelength, the travel the wave has traveled c times t distance, and 
that should be the full cycle. So it's not 4, it should be 4 over wavelength, and then we multiply by L squared, it should be 4 L over wavelength. Is that the number I should have? The 16 should have an 8. Four, two, the 16 should have an 8. 4, 2, 16 should be an 8. I'm missing a factor of 2 somewhere. I'm not quite sure. Oh, no, no. That's correct. Now the last two lines. Yes. Thank you. Okay. The 2s are terrible. Okay. Thank you. You should keep the project. That's k squared. This is k squared. Yeah. So you can add in the raise the five just some Oh, it's because I cross it out over here. Oh. So let me put it back in and I cross it out. Okay. okay. Sorry, it's a little sloppy, but um, but again, this so this dispersion relation just gives us this relation between the, the ends and wavelength. And then when we just add up the volume of quantum states up to a given wavelength, we get this number of nodes. Okay. What we get is this number of photons of a given wavelength. Right? Because if there's two photons per node, this is the number of photons per wavelength, which is starting to sound a lot like a distribution of energy from, from something that has a given potential. Okay. Okay, so we want to write down the distribution of photons per wavelength. All right, this is just the number of photons per wavelength, which we just written down. Divided by the volume of our box, right? So this is actually a density of photons. So when we say distribution, I mean density. Up to now, what we could write down is this box of psi L gives us that many photons that come to the wavelength. Now I'm just getting rid of the box entirely because I want to know what the density of that is, right? So that just gives me essentially our relationship over there, eight pi over three. L cube over lambda cube. And then the size of the box is just one, is just one over L cube. And that gives me a density of photons that's independent of the box. Right? So now it doesn't actually matter how big this box is. It doesn't matter what shape it is. Because I'm just calculating the density of photons inside this sort of region of constant temperature. But the yeah. wavelength can be any number, correct? Um, Wavelength can be any number. Well, now that we have it come up, come up there. So when you write that formula, and oh, sorry, yes, yeah, that's what I'm missing. Okay, so this is the number of photons at a given wavelength. <laughs> this is terrible. All right, so this n, this is n number of photons, and we want to do it per wavelength. So it's dn d wavelength, right? But that's really just taking the derivative of that term, right? So that actually gets rid of, which is good. That gets rid of. So we just one over lambda cube, we go minus three over lambda to the fourth. Alright. So we get rid of that, we get lambda to the fourth, uh, and we get something that looks like eight pi over lambda to the fourth, where I've dropped the minus sign because we're looking at sort of the, the density of these things, you can't have a negative density of photons. Okay? Thanks for catching that. Okay, so then uh, now we assume that each of these photons has a thermal energy. And what is a thermal energy? How do we write down thermal energy per, per object? Thanks. Nope. I want to guess what the temperature of an electron is for a given temperature. What's the best bet temperature? Okay, then when I've written average temperature is about KT. All right. Yeah. All right, so K is the Boltzmann constant. 
right, to your temperature. And so for a given object in a big gas, each particle has an average energy of about kT. So the total gas has an energy of the number of particles times kT. That's our sort of sound like PV times kT, right? So it's average energy for an ideal gas. So let's assume we have an ideal gas of photons. That means that if this is the density of photons per wavelength, we want the density of energy per wavelength, right? That's just this term times the average energy per photon, right? So that's just a pi kT over lambda to the four. Right. Now, just to note, we're getting close to this. We're not quite there. We're getting close to this. Okay, and then um, actually, this does give us basically what we want. Um, because the other thing we have to factor in here is the fact that this is the energy per photon, energy density per photon. What we want to know is how much of that is going out. So we need a term, a term that tells us the direction of the energy and how fast those photons are traveling. Okay, thank you very much. I was for All right, so power yeah. is energy per time. Right? What we have is a density of energy per wavelength, or energy per length, and one energy per time. And the idea we would multiply this by. Speed. Uh, Bingo. Okay, yeah. All right, so power is energy per wavelength uh, times C. Now, it's almost C. In fact, what it is is C over 4. And it's C over 4 because it's only traveling in one direction. Okay? And if you integrate sort of all the directions that it's that, that, that energy is traveling, uh, half of it is half of it's going this way, half it's going that way, but they're going in all directions to the average over sort of sine of the angle. You get another factor of two emitted in one direction. And that's what we care about. It's like traveling out of this black body box. So that's C over four. So what are we left with? We're left with a two pi kT C over lambda to the four. Now, uh, I just erased it, but I said that the Planck function, let me get that down so we don't mess that one up. Planck function is 2h c squared over lambda to the fifth, 1 over h c over lambda k t minus 1. Now, this isn't exactly this. We're off by a factor of power of wavelength. But let's be more careful here. This term here, if this is small, is 1 minus h c k t minus plus. All right? Minus 1. That goes away. And so we have 1 over this. We have lambda kT over hc replacing this term. All right? Cancel out the h, cancel out the c, cancel out one of the lambdas, and we've got our Planck relation modulo 1 pi, which I have no idea where that came from. <laughs> so I'm not going to try to find it now. At least functionally, it's about right. Okay? So, Taking this very simple box of photons model, model uh, we get something that is sort of the, again, the long wavelength approximation of the function. Question. Yeah. So looking from this side, I think um, in the assumption about steradian for the density of energy is where you get. That might be where the pi is in. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 have, yeah. So sorry. This is, yeah, I'm doing a plus. I haven't actually divided out by the steradian. So that might be the pi. I don't care. Right. What I really care about is actually the wavelength of Use the board instead of the cube. What's that? Use the board instead of the cube. Well, we divide about we divide about the area, so that would have got that still would have gotten rid of the pi, unfortunately. All right. So, so in any case, 
both these cases are, are the same for this sort of approximation of a box. Now, there's a big problem, though, because what does this function look like? Let's plot it. To it goes to infinity and beyond. All right. So wavelength as a function of, and remember, this is this is an energy, this is a power. All right. It's an intensity. So our intensity would look something like this. All right. So we have something that's really bad happening out here. Um, in fact, when you calculate this for a thermal, like something like 300 Kelvin, this gets really big around the ultraviolet range. So many times, for a long time, this is considered the ultraviolet catastrophe. Because everything would be really, really bright in the ultraviolet, and it isn't. All right, so something has to dock this down. Now, the thing that docks this down, and I'm not going to go through quite the same derivation here, because I think you've had enough, um, is that uh, you're not, we, it's actually right here, this assumption right here. Right, we assume that, that the average temperature of these photons was just like an ideal gas. Right? Ideal gas, the average temperature is about 80. The photons don't obey ideal gas. <laughs> we have a very different thermodynamics if that was the case. What kind of thing, thermodynamics do ideal do photons actually follow? What statistics do photons follow? Mm -hmm. The other Sorry, one. Whole so was Einstein, yeah. So instead of writing down average energy being kT, in fact the average energy um, is calculated by taking the Bose Einstein distribution and inserting the energy for a given photon at, at a given wavelength in that distribution. Uh, and what you get out, just very simply, is just hc over lambda, which is just h times nu, right, over e to the hc over lambda kt minus 1. And if we replace this kt with that expression, we get back out our photon relation. So, so quantum box works as long as you're careful about what is the actual energy of each of those photons. Like the energy is actually dictated not by ideal gas relations, but by those Einstein. Now we're going to see these kind of distribution calculations a lot when we start talking about the interiors of stars. So even though this is kind of mucked up a little bit, it's good to get an idea of sort of how these calculations are done. You're figuring out the distribution of objects and you're assigning that energy to that object. That gives you an energy distribution. You just have to be careful what that distribution, what distribution you're drawing. Is. This is wrong. But that's right. Okay. Questions on that? Sorry about my pies and stuff like that. Fortunately, you don't have to do that on the homework. Yeah. I get points if you have an extra pipe. Uh, if I give you a derivation like this on the exam, you're free to bring pitchforks and uh, stuff like that. Um, so, um, so one thing. So there's a couple things about this function itself, which I've now erased. Let me just write it down again. Okay, so a couple things about this relationship. First of all, there is a peak to this distribution. So what distribution looks like, it looks more like that. And there's a peak. And this distribution is determined really by just one parameter, the temperature. That's it. Right? We've Divided out the volume by doing this sort of energy density calculation, right? All, all it cares about is temperature. So this peak is very sensitive to temperature. And you probably know the, the relation uh, for finding this peak. This is Wien's displacement law. In fact, part of your homework is to derive Wien's displacement law. I'd like to write this as lambda t is about 3,000 micron Kelvin. All right, I think it's actually 2898 or something like that, but it's about 3,000. Uh, I remember that because a M dwarf is about 3,000 Kelvin and it peaks at 1 micron. It's K. All right, it's a good round number. Uh, the sun is about 6,000 microns, and it, or 6,000 Kelvin, and it peaks about, about half a micron or something. All right, so that's a good number to remember. Um, and then uh, the other thing to note is that 
this is an as this is an intensity. So uh, the other part of your homework this week is to actually go from this to fluxes and luminosities. And I'm not going to show you how to do that because it's your homework. But I will tell you that what you get out of this. are the Stefan-Boltzmann relations. And again, uh, it's just a matter of taking this intensity and integrating it to a flux density, and then integrating that to a flux, so going from watts per meter squared per wavelength per steradian to watts per meter squared per wavelength to watts per meter squared gives you flux. When you calculate that out, the flux that you get for an isotropic black body, which for the purpose of this class is how we're going to approximate all the stars that we look at, uh, is just a very simple relation of sigma t to the fourth, where sigma, sigma is the Stefan Boltzmann constant. Um, I even wrote that down anywhere. No, oh, I didn't. Uh, this works out to be 5.67 times 10 to the minus 8 watts per meter squared, there's your flux per Kelvin to the fourth power. Right? Or just remember something like five and two thirds. Or even better, seventeen thirds. Right? Anyways. Um, okay, so this is just a constant, basically wraps in a whole bunch of these constants come out of the integration. Uh, but again, it's only dependent on the temperature, very simply. Now to go from that to a luminosity, again, if we're talking about isotropic spherical objects, and we want to go from energy or power per meter squared or power per area to power, what would I multiply this by? An area of a sphere, which is 4 pi r squared. Yeah, makes that easy. Okay, 4 pi r squared sigma t to the This is an incredibly important equation for doing very basic analysis of star. In fact, we use it all the time. Um, because it relates some big numbers. It relates the size of the star, the temperature of the surface of the star, or at least we'll talk about what that surface means, and the total power coming off that star. Right? And it's important to remember, this is so, uh, and sometimes you'll see that this is written as effective temperature, right? Because it's obviously not the temperature of the inside of the star, because that would be really hot, but also at a very small radius. Right? It's, a it's a surface of where actually the, the, the light comes out. And um, we start talking about opacity. In fact, the, the wavelengths where light comes out, it doesn't come out at the same level inside the star at different wavelengths. We're going to start seeing spectra that have various features. We have a really deep absorption feature. You're actually getting light from a higher part of the atmosphere, a colder part of the atmosphere, which means that this number is really kind of an average over all wavelengths. So when we talk about the sun being 56, 58, 5700 Kelvin, that's an effective temperature for the average of the sun, average over all wavelengths. In fact, at different wavelengths, you might see a high, higher or lower part of the sun, uh, lower part of the sun, a hotter or cooler part of the sun. Okay. All right. Questions about that? OK, uh, now one place where these like, black body radiation, oh, let me do one thing here. Let me prove to you that there is black body radiation out in space. So this is a spectrum of the sun. Uh, and again, this is in terms of, this is watts per meter squared per nanometers. It's called irradiance, but what would we call this? Yeah, good. Flux density. Okay. Uh, so this has got the steradians average out of it. Uh, and this is actually a measurement, I think this is a measurement near, I have to go back and look at this, but I think this is a measurement from the ground. Uh, but it's been corrected for absorption from our atmosphere. So this is, it's sort of extrapolated to what the irradiance of the sun, or the flux density of the sun is at the top of the atmosphere. And that distribution looks very much like the solid line, which is a black body. But there are variations, right? First of all, there's a lot of this scattery stuff over here. Now, this is not noise because the sun is really bright. It's very good, easy to get very high signal noise data for the sun. 
so these are actually real features in the spectrum of the sun. Uh, there's also some deriva deviations at longer wavelengths. Uh, some of that is just the, the, this particular black body fits not perfect for the sun, uh, but it's also that there's other sources of radiation that come out at different wavelengths, at cooler wavelengths that are sort of above the sun's surface that also contribute to light out here as well. So, so we do have black bodies out in space, as it turns out. It's not just a crazy idea. Now, uh, this, this relation in particular, so uh, it becomes very useful when we look at one instrument that astronomers use a lot in studying stars, and that's called the HR diagram. So the HR part of the HR diagram is Hertzsprung and Russell. Uh, Hertzsprung wrote about this in 1907. Russell wrote about this in 1913. Independent, although separated by six years, discoveries. Right? Communication was a lot slower back then. Um, and this is actually a plot from Russell's 1914 article on his diagram, or half of his diagram. Uh, and what it is is we talk about uh, different magnitudes and combined magnitudes into colors. That's all this is. It's a color magnitude diagram. It's taking the most basic photometry and just putting points on a plot and seeing where they lie. Right, so this axis, so it's very hard to see, uh, is color, in this case B minus V, and this is magnitude, in this case apparent magnitude. Uh, but if most of the stars that he's looking at are fairly nearby, that could be roughly equivalent to absolute. Now, uh, if you were to do a drawing like this, actually, I think I'm going to do that. You can actually show some more recent data. This is a Parco's data of a similar type of measurement. Uh, this is, again, V minus V magnitude, going from negative numbers to high numbers. And now this is capital M, so this is absolute magnitude. Remember, Hipparchos was a satellite that measured the parallaxes for a whole bunch of stars. So this is the actual brightness of those stars as a function of power. And literally, this is just an exercise in just putting two variables next to each other. But the interesting thing is that you have a lot of interesting structure in this diagram. And we're going to come back into this diagram many times, because not only does this tell us about the properties of the stars that we're looking at, but also tells a lot about how stars evolve as they get uh, to later stages. And so the bulk of the stars that we see, at least Hipparco saw in the nearby solar neighborhood, follow this sort of trajectory right through the middle of the plot. And we call this the main sequence, right? it's the main part of where stars lie. In the plot. But there are a lot of other sort of spurs that come off of this. There are these things that are very red and very bright. Again, absolutely bright, not just apparently bright, but absolutely bright, so very luminous, that lie out here at this end of the plot. We call these red giants. Uh, and then we have these things down here. In fact, there's only one thing down here in this plot, uh, which is very blue and very dim that lies out here way, way down at this part of the plot. And for reasons uh, mostly historical, we call these things white dwarfs, mostly because the first time it was found was uh, Proxima Centauri, Sorry, the companion to Sirius B, my fault, Sirius B, uh, which is about 10,000 Kelvin, which makes it look white. But it was very, very, very low luminosity. Right. Now, again, this is just an exercise of observation, but there is uh, a reason why these stars lie on this part of the plot. Uh, we just talked about black body radiation. This color running from blue, right, B minus B less than zero, which means the B magnitude is a smaller number than the V magnitude, which means the B magnitude is brighter. Roll that through your head a little bit. Okay. Uh, that would be a situation where if you were looking at the spectrum of this object, you would peak out at shorter wavelengths. Something that's over at this side would peak out at longer wavelengths. And so this is the B band, and this is the V band. You can imagine this is so much of the spectra will look like. Uh, we just talked about how the wavelength at which these stars peak in the radiation is longer for cooler objects. That's the displacement. And so this color is really tracking temperature. Right? The redder we go, the cooler the object. This side, as I mentioned, is the absolute brightness of the star. So that's easy. It's how much light, how big this black body function goes up and down. So this is luminosity. So this is equivalent to plotting that's something that's like a temperature versus luminosity plot. Although it's a weird one because high temperatures are on this end and low temperatures are on this end. 
So this is the observer's HR diagram. You can also have what's known as the theorist HR diagram, where we replace color with key effective, and we replace absolute magnitude with volumetric luminosity. And again, what we find, because it's really just a one-to-one -one mapping, is that most of the stars fall along some middle part of this plot. There are some that are over here, and there are very few that are over down here. Essentially exactly the same. Now, we have a relationship between effective temperature and luminosity. Over there. Right? So let's do a little trick, which I'd like to do, which I promise like to do. Luminosity is 4 pi r squared sigma t to the fourth. Let's divide by the same relation to the sun. Okay, all these little circle dots underneath just refer to the sun's properties. Right, that gets rid of all these pesky constants. And now let's take the log of those both sides. So log L over L sun is equal to 2 log R over R sun plus 4 log T over T sun. So essentially, comparing these two values, temperature and luminosity on the same plot, gives us a proxy for radius. We can map out radius on this plot. Usually this is plotted in the which you find out why it's useful, useful radius in this form. So something that's very luminous, but very low temperature, it has to have a very big radius. And consequently, if something is very hot, very low luminosity, you have to have a very small radius. So on this plot, and this is part of your homework as well, you will find that you can mark off lines of constant radius across here, right? Where uh, this line is something like, which actually doesn't cross through the sun, so let me redraw this, all right? So this is something like one solar radius, right? Up here, what you would find just using this relation, right, is that this region is somewhere around 100 solar radii, and this region is around 0.01 solar radii. So again, just using real simple measurements, real basic measurements, and converting them into actual physical units, you start to get an idea of what these objects actually look like. And this is why we call these this part of the diagram the red giant phase, because they're really big. <laughs> they're giant stars, 100 times the radius of the sun. Where consequently these white dwarfs are, are actually even dwarfier than the normal dwarfs that we have along the sequence. They're hundred times, so about the size of the Earth. So again, once we started ruminating, we realized that the stars have a much uh, broader range of properties than we had expected. Uh, how we do? Okay, that's it. So um, just saying, I'm a little behind on my schedule, so I'm going to figure out how to skip forward in the next class through spectroscopy. Um, but we'll wait for that then. Okay, good luck on your homework. See you on Thursday.